This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with Dr. Morris O. Phelps, conducted by Fran Lane on July 12th, 2007. Today we're at the University of Georgia Visitor Center in the Four Towers Building on College Station Road in Athens, Georgia. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Phelps. Thank you. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, tell us a little bit about your early days. I know you're a Kentucky boy. I was born in central Kentucky about oh, 30, 40 miles from Bowling Green. You know where Bowling mm -hmm. Green is. Well, I was born out in the country from Bowling yeah. Green, so that gives you some, some sort of perspective <laughs> where, where I was. And my father was a farmer when I was born, but he changed that pretty quickly. He, uh, Finally, after working in a coal mine for a year or two, he decided he couldn't support his family on that, so he moved into Louisville and got a job with the tire company and worked for them for a while. And then he got a job with Reynolds Metal Company, which uh, he stayed with for about 50 years. 50 so that years? That, yeah, that's a pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good job. <laughs> and actually his... Uh, Their lives. Is that right? And I wandered off and came down to Georgia and uh, stayed here and uh, went to the university and then uh, uh, went into service and then came back to the university after a few years in the Atlanta public school system. Tell me about your first, I remember you telling a story about when you first saw Athens, Georgia. First tell us what, what brought you to Athens, Georgia from Kentucky. Well, uh, Wally Butts was my high school football coach in 1937, and we had an undefeated season, won 10 games. In fact, we actually won 11 games because he said they made a mistake and scheduled two teams the same night. So we beat two teams the same <laughs> night. We had an undefeated season. And one of the uh, highlights of that season is we went to Miami and beat Miami High 33 to 7, the worst they had ever been beaten. And uh, while I was at the university, a guy named uh, uh, Gene Ellenson was a freshman with me and he was from Miami High, and he would be bragging about Miami High, and if I walked into the room, he'd just shut up. <laughs> Didn't have anything to say. Heck at me for coming in and disturbing his uh, dialogue. Uh, so, so Coach Butts brought you down this way? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, he, this was in 1937, and I was a junior in 1937. In 1938, um, I was captain of the team in 1938, and uh, 1937, he brought two fellows down here when he came down in uh, the fall of 38. Um, Tommy Witt, who played center and who was killed in some of the first action in World War II. He uh, took uh, aviation training out of Ben Epps Field here and was uh, sent over to North Africa and um, uh, in a formation over there somebody clipped his tail off Gosh. and he fell down and died. Right, He was one of the first right guys in the beginning. of World War Ben Boone came with him from Mayo High. Those two came down with Wally Butts. Wally Butts came down here as an assistant coach his first year, and uh, those two came with him. The next year, Everett Horn and I came down, and uh, this was after our senior year, and he brought uh, the four of us down from Mayo High School. And one of the most interesting uh, 
things that has happened to me in my life was the trip I came down here the first time was to Speck Town. Speck drove his big old Dodge down here through eastern Kentucky, and that was all mountains, and no uh, super highways or anything, just plain old two-lane roads. And he drove at least 100 miles an hour <laughs> the whole way, you know, Speck Town. And it was just a thrill. <laughs> you just proud to get here. Oh, I was <laughs> excited to get here. I never wanted to go back, but I was really thrilled to come here. I didn't know where I was going. I thought maybe I was going to Georgia Tech. That's the only one I'd ever heard of. But uh, I came to Athens, and uh, we came for a foot for the Georgia Georgia Tech football game at the end of our season. They brought us down to let us see that game, and then actually signed us to play the next year. And uh, uh, we spent the weekend and then, of course, went back home and then came back uh, after the next uh, uh, season started. Actually, I was uh, uh, sort of a misfit as far as the timing was concerned because I uh, graduated end of uh, the first semester of my senior year. Somehow or other I got mixed up and graduated a semester early and they brought me down here spring quarter. So that messed me up all the way through school because I was um, uh, ahead of myself. In fact, I didn't even take ROTC because they said I couldn't take it because I was out of money. And, uh, but uh, I came from Louisville in uh, February, and it was strictly winter up then, <laughs> dead of winter, everything was dead. We came down here and everything was beginning to bloom and blossom and the azaleas and the camellias All the other trees were beginning to bloom and blossom, and everything was just beautiful. I thought I'd come to Athens, <laughs> and it was still winter in, in Kentucky, and it was, you know, beginning of spring here, just like uh, maybe uh, beginning of spring quarter here. Well, you know, how pretty it is. Ah, let's see. And uh, so. Uh, the four of us came down here, and uh, as luck would have it, none of us really were ever uh, real good, productive players. I played uh, and got a letter, and Everett Horn got a letter our junior year, and then I graduated early because I was out of state wow. and uh, went in service early. So I did, never, never did finish my senior year. And my wife, Greg, who I met uh, as a freshman here and married at the end of my uh, junior year, actually my senior year, I had enough credit to graduate, so I graduated and we married uh, at the end of that year, which was in uh, oh, uh, September 1942, and I went on into the service instead of coming back for my senior year of uh, college football. Uh, and Greg fusses at me all the time about that because the team went to the Rose Bowl <laughs> that fall and I would have gone to the Rose Bowl and she got mad at, gets mad at me all the time for marrying her and not going to the Rose Bowl. But that's the way well, life works. I was going to say, knowing Miss Phelps, I think marrying her may be one of the best things you ever did. <laughs> and probably better than going to the Rose Bowl. Oh. Talk to us a little bit. You talked about how beautiful it looked when you came down in that first year. Do you remember campus has changed so much? Do you remember what campus was like when you first arrived here and, and what? It was pretty raw in a lot of places. We had a guy, I've forgotten his name, 
rode a horse that was in charge of the flowers and the vegetation and the landscape. And he was just great. He had everything going just uh, beautiful. And you might uh, remember what his name was. Do you know who it was? Oh, no, he's too skinny. Oh, well, this is very flammable. <laughs> But he uh, was in charge of all that beautification, and they did a great job. We had 3,000 students. A little bit different from the day. <laughs> and uh, uh, we had 3,000 students up until World War II. And I think we went down much lower than that during the war. And then after the war, uh, when I came in as director of admissions, we had uh, 6,000 students uh, right after the war. And then uh, when I left as director of admissions, uh, well, how much longer was that? That was about 20 years yeah. later. We had, uh, what, 60,000? Uh, I, I would think 16 or 20,000, certainly yeah, by I then. We got about 35. 30, yeah, we have 30,000 now. Well, from one period there, we went from uh, 6,000 students to 30,000 yeah. students over about a 10 year period. That's how fast we grew in that uh, uh, period of time. When I was director of admissions, we grew that fast. And we had to put a lid on it and had a hard time doing that because we had so many people wanting to come here. Absolutely, and, and, and it's, it's even worse now, Dr. Phelps, I'll well, tell you that's that. That's what I understand. <laughs> Let's go back. I want to go back to your undergrad years. Okay. Did you, um, where did you live when you were here in uh, school? We started out in a dormitory. I started out in a dormitory called New Boys Dormitory. New Boys. Which is across. Across from Legion, who's that? Would that, would that be Clark, Clark Howe? Clark Howe, that's what it's called. Clark Howe, New Boys, that's a great name. Do, do they have a dormitory there now? Actually, it's career yeah, planning yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's some of the... But it was a dormitory that freshman year. <coughs> and uh, uh, the spring I was here, we uh, lived there, but we ate our meals at Miss Bicker's who was a sporting house, mm -hmm. and she had the best meals I have ever seen. We, uh, I weighed 160 pounds, 65 pounds when I came here, and three months later, at the end of that spring quarter, I weighed 185 pounds, <laughs> eating that good sporting house uh, Big Big biscuits. Yeah, he just indulged. Well, you did the freshman 15, and you did that in three months then. Three months, Didn't yeah, take I, you the whole year. Actually, I had never been on any kind of regular meal up until then, and I ate those three meals a day here. It was fantastic. You had come to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> what other campus involvements? I know Coach Butts had y'all pretty tied up in terms of yeah. other than academics, but... Well, our girl. So we spent a lot of time between here and Ford. And I bet. And um, uh, I met Greg out there and Leo Costas and Lamar Davis had girlfriends out there. And we all used to go out there and stay as long as we could. We had to leave at 8 o'clock every night except on weekends. And during the week we had to leave at 8 o'clock and uh, couldn't stay later than how did you get out there? Did you? Everybody was out back in those days. And everybody gave everybody rides. And you could get a taxi for 10 cents, so that wasn't too bad. Yeah. 
The world has changed, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, we, uh, spent, uh, Friday night from after practice at 7 o'clock till 8 o'clock. <laughs> and then, uh, the weekend we would go out and spend the day wherever we didn't have, they didn't have to be in 7 o'clock on the weekend. Talk a little bit about, you were a Sigma Chi here, weren't you? Yes, uh, that was an interesting situation. I didn't have any money, and it cost, uh, oh, I think $75 to join. And three of the brothers wanted me to join so badly, they both, all three, loaned me $25 apiece to join. So I borrowed the money from them, and as soon as I graduated and went in service, I paid them back $25 a piece, and so I was a Sigma Chi for, oh, about uh, two years, and uh, we had a good uh, atmosphere in the fraternity. They didn't have any drinking. Or any good group of people. Huh? Good group of people. Oh, yeah, a nice group. Have, have you kept up with some of those folks? Oh, yeah, I keep up with all. Ben Boone, one of the fellows who came down here from Mel High, was a member, and he uh, helped me join with the Sigma Chi. And uh, we, we would go out there, and all oh, several uh, nights on the weekend, and just sit around or whatever we did. Where was the Sigma Chi house then? It was on Hill Street. One of those big old, big old Victorian yeah, houses on Hill second Street. Second house from the corner there on Hill Street. Uh, uh, big house. I didn't, we didn't live there. I lived in the dormitory. We, we moved from uh, Clark House dormitory over to uh, uh, Millage. Over there. Over there. Right behind the stadium. They had, yeah, right Coach there. Butts had you under his thumb right that way. Well, Clint Lumpkin was our supervisor, and he was a great guy. He was the one that kept us out of trouble. And, uh, you talk a little bit, talk a little bit about Coach Lumpkin and Coach Butts for us. hard-working uh, attitude, and he really was that on the field. Off the field, he was so docile, you could put, stick a pin in him and he would get you for it. But he was just a great guy off the field. On the field, he was as mean as anything you've ever he seen. Makes. And he made a good football player out of you, and he made a good team out of you. And as mentioned earlier, we were undefeated in high school as last year at Mayo High School. And then down here we went to the uh, Orange Bowl his, oh, in 1942 and then in 1943 or that next year he went to the Rose Bowl. So he had a good team. And it happened fast for him too, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Current events of the day. Then you, he, we were, you were here during the early stages of the of the Second World War, yeah. and then and and so campus was probably a little bit different than it would have been during uh, peacetime. Actually, the war didn't affect us much in the beginning. The war started in December of forty two, forty one, forty one, and. Uh, didn't really affect us much until that following uh, summer and fall. And uh, so, uh, and I left at the end of that following summer to go into service. So uh, I wasn't affected much by it, but 
a lot of the other people were mm -hmm. they were trying to finish school and uh, get ready to go into service. The social life here was really good from uh, before the war and then during the first few months of the war. Uh, most all of the fraternities and sororities had dances at Woodruff Hall. Mm -hmm. Woodruff Hall is where the psychology journalism building is now. It was a, a temporary type structure and um, they played the basketball games there and they had the dances there. And almost every fraternity and sorority had a dance every year mm -hmm. there and invited the whole campus. And it was really an interesting place to, to go and they had big bands. They had Jimmy Dorsey, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, all those big bands came through here. And one that I remember particularly was one that had Frank Sinatra singing with it. That was one of the highlights of our uh, social scene. It was uh, Tommy Dorsey that had him singing with it. Well, that little commencement was little that commencement. Little commencement was uh, uh, in the fall, I believe, and uh, that was a four dances over a week. There, they had a tea dance uh, Friday morning, a regular dance. Well, now you took the same girl to every every one. Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> if you were lucky, <laughs> and you were lucky, you did. But uh, actually, you could take a different girl to each one. Well, Aunt Martha, who was out in the er, in the late twenties, told me you didn't want to go to a dance and and dance with the same fella the whole time. No, that was no, not no. the thing to do. Yeah. season and uh, most everybody was involved in it. Of course we were not integrated so that's not a problem. Talk to us a little bit about your military service. Where? I had a very interesting military service. I didn't get to take advantage of some seeds so I went directly into the military service went to uh, basic training out of Camp Crowder, Missouri with the Signal Corps. I don't know how I got in the Signal Corps, but I must have done sort of something working there, probably as a result of a, uh, some kind of test or something that they take mm -hmm. in the beginning. And uh, I went through uh, uh, basic training and then they sent me to Camp uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey to take some Signal Corps work there. And then while I was there, they chose me to go to OCS at Fort Monmouth. So I went to OCS there and got my commission, which was a four month uh, program. And uh, it was a very interesting situation. Greg and I had married before I went to uh, basic training, and uh, she came up and worked at Fort Monmouth, and uh, I got to see her once a week or something like that during that time. And then uh, at OCS, I was sent uh, to a school for cryptography. into the regular Signal Corps message center operation and was assigned to um, MacArthur's headquarters in the Pacific. And I went out there uh, in October of 
recording four or forty three of them, which it was, and uh, stayed in his headquarters as a signal officer for uh, two years, and then uh, stayed in the occupation for uh, activities with him for an additional year because I didn't have enough points to come home. You had to have so many points to come home after the war ended, and I didn't have any points because we didn't have any children, and that was how you got your points. And so I stayed an extra year over there in the occupation forces. It was very interesting. The Japanese were so cooperative in Virginia, and uh, my room boy who cleaned up my room for me was Japanese, and he was a kamikaze pilot until the war ended, and then he became my room boy, <laughs> and it was a very interesting situation with him. Okay. And we had uh, uh, very uh, good experiences. We traveled all over Japan, and uh, Greg was not there. He couldn't come, and uh, so I came home about 1944 and uh, looked for some sort of job to do, and finally found a uh, job where the Atlanta Public School System was a teacher and coach, and I coached with Joel Lee, who People. Wow. Uh, he uh, was a coach at Murphy High School, and so they assigned me there, and I coached for him <coughs> for a while, and then uh, he went back to Auburn, as you see, and I stayed on at Murphy as a head basketball coach, and then I took some graduate <coughs> course and worked on a doctorate. Uh, I already had my uh, I already had my master's degree because while I was teaching at Murphy High, I, I got uh, my master's degree through uh, evening classes and Saturday classes at Emory University, and uh, Emory sent me to the University of Minnesota one summer. over here and work on my doctorate. My major professor was Jimmy Green, who was a great teacher and a real help to me in getting my doctorate. And uh, he, he helped me uh, with set up my dissertation and all that sort of thing. And uh, got my doctorate in education. back over here as uh, uh, assistant director of the nation's Walter Banner and uh, Walter was uh, a good person to work for because he let you always do what you needed to do and then finally they separated the two jobs he was uh, director of missions and registrar and they finally just made him registrar made me director of the mission. And for about 20 years, I was director of the mission. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we grew from 3,000 to, to uh, from 6,000 to 30,000 students during that time. So we were pretty busy over there yeah. in the mission. Uh, where you were. That's <laughs> right. We were busy. What, 
what, when you came back to campus in 1959, uh, was it obvious that there were big changes? Of course, you'd been coming to, to graduate school, so you were seeing it all along, but since yeah. you had left, did you see some? Well, uh, the changes were pretty gradual in the beginning, but they became uh, faster and faster as time went right. on. And uh, the, the university was uh, getting more and more important in the eyes of the citizens of the state of Georgia and of the world. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. When you came back, you came back in 1959 to work, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the Civil Rights Movement was gathering steam across the South at that time. What was the climate on our campus? City Hall and uh, the uh, uh, judicial system was already in progress mm -hmm. and there was no point in making a big deal about it. And they realized that we had to go ahead and do whatever the justice system told us to do and we did it and it was worked out fine. And it was the right thing to do at the yeah, time. Yeah, I don't think there was anybody Some of the old heads probably would gladly have shot both of those people who were trying to get in, but that was just uh, the thing to do, and I think old Seattle was probably the key to the thing. And he and Walter Danner were good friends, and so they, they worked it out pretty well. We were not going to close the university. <laughs> The gov it was an interesting time too, because Governor Vanderbilt had campaigned on the on the issue that he would not integrate yeah, the schools, yeah. and yet he too. Yeah, I think he knew he, he was sparking up a rage, and, uh, and I think most all the people involved were uh, happy to go along with whatever they had to do. Did y'all get a lot of pressure? A lot of you know folks calling and and. No. You talked before about the way things almost exploded, Dr. Phelps. I guess it was the baby boomers. It was some of us who came along yeah. in my generation that, that all you folks were back from the war and suddenly there were babies everywhere. Yeah. And we all hit about late 19, mid 1960s till I guess what, end of the 70s. Yeah. What? What did you do? Baby boomers were pouring into schools everywhere. What was the was the greatest challenge? Just finding enough space, or, yeah, or right. trying yeah. to corral things so that you'd have space. So I, and uh, everybody pitched in and, and cooperated, and uh, uh, it's not over yet either. They're still <laughs> still going strong. That's that's true. Uh, we probably have 70,000 contacts a year in here with people coming to look at the University of yeah. Georgia and it is just amazing. You, you talked about how the universities become important and, and you may have a better perspective on this, but I see it now as something that, that is a real engine in a number of ways for things that happen economically in the state, but also it's gotten to be a real political kind of a place. Was it always that way? Was it that way when you were a director of admissions? Or? Well, political stream that was flowing in the background and none of our presidents ever put any pressure on us to admit people to the university who should not be admitted. And 
And I would rather see them put the way they're handling that situation. Of course, we've had alternate plans and programs for these people. They could always go somewhere for a, a year or two and then come to the university. And it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. So the community, what used to be the old community college system was a, was a good option for folks yeah. to do a year or two of work and then transfer in. Wh what about, I know when we were uh, in, the er in the early 70s, there was, there was a, an attempt, there was a formula plugged in a grade point average and other, other kinds of things and, and, uh, to be fair to people, basically. And and yeah, at the point, I think there was a different formula for boys and girls, and that caused a little bit of consternation well, sometimes. Well, Louise McBee did away with that. <laughs> she she was very strong on using the same uh, criteria for, for girls everybody. And boys, and that's why we have a lot more girls now than we do boys. The the girls make better grades in high school because they're nicer and the teachers like them better, and they give them better grades. And I've done research that proves that, but it didn't make any difference. They still, the girls still got better grades, and they, uh, the formulas all took that into consideration, and they got in. You've, you've heard about, in the last 10 years, the discussion that boys are, are, are sort of a lost gender, that they, are, they don't know what to do, they are, have you got some thoughts on that? What? No, I, I think uh, uh, boys are going to make it out, make out one way or another. And uh, if they're not ready for the college scene, well, they go do something else, go into service. And may, may come later. Yeah. Talk to us about campus personality over the pa personalities over the years. Who were some of those people that stand out in your mind that were maybe on the faculty or, or on the staff that were, were uh, Dean Tate, for example, Dr. Phelps. Everybody's got a Dean Tate story, and yeah. I know you probably got one. Well, Dean Tate, of course, is was a character in his own right, and, and was great for the university. I think he was a jewel. did a lot of good for the university, mm -hmm. I thought, but um, we don't have a Dean Tate now, no. we don't really have to have one, and um, can't uh, really operate the same way, he sort of did it on the fly, didn't he? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, he, was, he was a real character, and we've had some other people who have done the same Sits one over there that's uh, done the Claude. Same, some of the same kind of stuff. And uh, there are other people that uh, have, have uh, contributed Had to the same. character of the university. You talked about Dr. Jimmy Green in graduate school. Was there somebody in undergraduate school who, who was an influence on you or who made a Change cheat you. or lie or steal for you, <laughs> and they should. No other life changers, maybe, in that time. No. How about Hugh Hodgson? Well, now, Hugh was in a different situation, you see, and I think his contribution was really great in the uh, art field and the music field, and Lamar died, too, probably. As far as that's concerned, Lamar was an egotist and an egotistical 
But at the same time, he was doing a good job in his field, and Hugh was even better in his job, I thought. What accomplishments are you most proud of in your life? That's a tough No, I, I'm uh, proud that I was able to come into this situation and keep it going steady and not having any uh, real difficulties with it. Um, I've had a lot of people accuse me of uh, favoritism or cheating or lying or stealing. None of those are true. No. I could prove to all of them that none of them were true. And uh, so that is a good thing to have on your record that they can go back and look it up and see that it, that it uh, uh, it's a record shows that people earned what they got, and they certainly didn't give them anything. I've had lots of parents come up to me recently and say, you were tough on my son, but he, he made it, and I was proud of him for making it. And that's what you want. I was glad to turn some of those parents who were upset at the time that I was talking to over to you to talk to. It was good to do that. Well, yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about your family. Talk about Miss Phelps and Paula and... Well, my uh, daughter has got a miraculous thing with her uh, ability. She is um, a computer and a electronics uh, whiz. She can get on her computer and talk to somebody in China and not cost anybody anything. And that's amazing to me that she can do that. And uh, my wife is very stable and settled and does a good job with whatever she's doing. And uh, so I'm proud of my family and that uh, we are both 85 years old and when you get that old, you're still going strong. <laughs> That's a great accomplishment. That's a great accomplishment. Talk, yeah. about, talk about Max and Brad. Well, these are my two grandsons and they're both doing very well too. And I've got a great grandson or daughter, great granddaughter that is that right? Yeah. When is who's having that baby? About six weeks. That's great. Yeah. Well, tell Paula she's a lot older than I am. Okay. Paula and I were born on the same day. Oh. Well, uh, I see you're both working hard. <laughs> talk. Uh, anything else, Dr. Phipps, that you'd like to to talk about that when we started talking about having this time together you thought might be a good thing to get on the record or? I don't really know of anything that uh, I think the university has made great strides in recent years and uh, in the last 40, 50 years has done a good job everything under control. Well, it's amazing just from being here to see the people who are coming from all over the country. Yeah. Alaska, Hawaii, uh, we have a, we had a visitor in this morning from Germany. Yeah. Um, we we are I know that happened somewhat 25 30 years ago, but now we are we're mentioned in the same breath with Virginia and North Carolina and some of these fine schools around and uh, I don't know if you saw it this week, I think. We're ninth in the country on study abroad, number of students going 
st study abroad, and we're ahead of a lot of those other folks that everybody thinks are top notch. And I know the study abroad program was something that you really you enjoyed travel, and that was something that was a a, a good thing you thought. We did that for about 20 years, and it was not anything extra uh, curricular or anything. It was just something that we did during our vacation mm -hmm. times, and we would take uh, groups of 20 or 30 people. Uh, we took groups to London almost every Christmas, uh, groups of Twenty or thirty people, and uh, we know they had a good time mm -hmm. and they enjoyed uh, seeing the world. And we've taken groups to uh, the Far East and also to other parts of Europe, and I've really enjoyed that contact that I've made with uh, those people. Someday I'm going to get to do that well, more than I have now. You so better start because it goes fast, doesn't it? It's as old as I am. You can't do it. <laughs> Anything else, Claude, that you Tell have? Tell us about the walking stick. <laughs> that walking A great stick. bulldog. Yeah. My wife bought that at uh, one of the stores here in town. It's got a uh, bulldog on it. Maybe Winston Churchill takes her for well, her that's okay. both be a bulldog. Well, if he's got a cigar, if he's got a cigar in his mouth, it's, no, it's Mr. Churchill. <laughs>